Put on your favorite game day gear because college football is heating up and FanDuel wants you to get in on the action. Right now, new customers can get no sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's $1,000 back in free bets if your first bet doesn't win. There's so many different ways to bet on college football. Bet on the money line, spread, and who you think will win it all with national championship futures. If you've been thinking about joining FanDuel, now is the perfect time to give it a shot. The app is so easy to use. They're always hooking you up with great promotions. And when you win, you'll get paid fast. Download the FanDuel app and sign up with promo code BLUEWIRE and get your no sweat first bet up to $1,000 for college football. That's promo code BLUEWIRE exclusively on America's number one sports book. 21 or older and present in Arizona. First online real money wager only. Refund issued as non-withdrawable free bets that expires in 14 days. Restrictions apply. See terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-NEXT-STEP or text NEXT STEP to 53342. Hey everyone. Welcome to The Final Four is Not on the Schedule. I'm your host, Eric, alongside with expert analyst, Rod. Thanks for joining us on the best MSU basketball podcast featuring an in-depth recruiting, game matchup, and post-game analysis. We dive deep to give you the best tools to enjoy the Spartans and impress your friends and family. Hey, everybody. It's Eric alongside Rod and here to uh, celebrate our narrow 78-77 victory over the University of Portland in the fifth place game of the Phil Knight Invitational, PK-85. Uh, before we start, I just want to remind you that we still have a week to go for picks to win the free t-shirt, the t-shirt contest. So if you want to make your predictions for the Big Ten standings, 1 through 14, uh, send those to me at eric at tffinots.com. Make sure you obviously leave your name and then also the amount of points Michigan State scores against Michigan this season as a tiebreaker. Well, Rod... Um, I think one thing we can rest assured at least at least early in the season is that if you have a coronary condition, you have been stress tested and there you, you should feel comfortable because you have had a what this is like our third straight almost near loss at as we get to the end of the season or the beginning of the season still. Uh, I don't I don't know what to say except you know I could kind of feel this one coming, but then you know would Joey miss that three that would have made it fifteen that would have made it sort of a laugher you know then kind of the wheels came off and. And I don't know. I mean, I, I guess to just let you, you you riff a little bit because this is one of those games where, I mean, yes, we're glad they win. A month from now, we're not going to remember any of this about this game. I mean, you might remember it, but you're not going to like, it doesn't matter that you win by one or win by 10, except that it, is this a sign of, you know, who this team really is or is this, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, in some ways, I feel like that last possession, it could easily have been a foul called. I'm not prepared to say that because, um, they are missing two big components and, and sure for as much as it means on the offensive end, I've now sort of concluded, and this isn't, <laughs> this isn't any great revelation, but I think it's impacting them more defensively. Now yeah. they found some answers for that, which we'll get to Jason Whiten's, but, um, yep. but still in that, in that kind of freak out, in the last minute 10, I would feel much more comfortable with Malik Hall and Jaden Akins on that court, or one of them at least. Um, if only because I would feel they'd have a better chance of actually locating shooters. You know, they did such a fantastic job for 19 minutes, or we'll say 18 minutes and 50 seconds, in terms of really clamping down not just Portland's accuracy, but even the attempts they got. We talk about that all the time. The best thing you can do in defending the three is don't let the opponent get those shots off. And Michigan State really stepped it up after a pretty miserable first half in that department and, and just locked them down. And then just in, in, in part, I think, because the turnovers were leading to scramble situations, just forgot to cover anybody. It was awful. Those yeah. threes that, that they hit were wide open threes. I mean, the last one, I guess you give Madi a little credit for getting out there and contesting it, but that's solely due to his length and athletic ability. The fact is he wasn't in good guarding position and you saw it on the replay. Robbie Hummel mentioned it, which by the way, just as an aside, 
I like Robbie Hummel as an analyst anyway, but um, I've never been so thankful in my life to have Robbie Hummel doing a broadcast after the last two games. Um, but that said, um, <laughs> so even there on that one where it was semi-contested, it, it shouldn't have ever been a clean look at all, even a halfway clean look, because he was so far out of position, didn't realize who he was guarding, as Hummel correctly noted. Um, you know, in that situation, why are you ever in the paint? <laughs> you know? Right. I mean, yeah, yeah, right. No, yeah. When you're down. Yeah. Up yeah, four, yeah. You know what they're going to do. You have to be, you have to be on the perimeter, you know? And, and that's a team that obviously, as we saw throughout a good portion of this game, pretty much everybody is a threat, you know? So, um, look, it's, I'll start with the good. If you told any Michigan state fan, and I mean, any that, after the first seven games of this schedule, Michigan State would be sitting there at five and two. They have taken it and run. And if you say you wouldn't, you're lying. Yeah. That's that is a bottom line truth here. But the way they are finishing games, this is the last three wins have been in this department. Um it it really is concerning. And it's most, it's mostly, I'm not going to, everybody deserves a share of the blame. You know, Joey Hauser deserves some blame. I've seen him take a lot of criticism on social media before tonight and also after this game. Um, but the primary burden is AJ Hogarth. That, that's just simple period. I, I personally can't accept any other answer. That is your point guard. That is your floor leader. And he made of those three turnovers late, he made two of them. And the third, the one that might get charged to Hauser, I'm not sure, on the inbound pass, I put halfway on AJ, too, because he didn't come hard to the ball. Yeah. So, you and he is easily, for me, the most frustrating player in recent memory at Michigan <laughs> State, maybe ever, for me, maybe ever. Because I, I tend to be on the more optimistic, forgiving side of the slate. I'm pretty slow to start really coming at guys. And, and I'll admit, I was not a believer in AJ Hogarth when they recruited him, nor was I during his freshman year. Last year, he pr certainly proved me and, and many other people wrong by showing that he was at least capable of being a productive player and maybe even something more than that. And when he's at his best, as he was for the first, say, 18 minutes and 50 seconds of that second half, after a pretty miserable first half, to be honest, um, you see how he can elevate this team because he just did everything right. I mean, yeah. great passes, was under control, went to really what is his one great offensive strength, which is getting the ball to the rim and finishing, and he did it repeatedly. And then he played much better defense than we've seen lately. You know, that's one of the really discouraging things to me about him this year. You can talk about the turnovers, but to me, it's that a guy that I know full well is capable of being a really good defensive player has only been spottily that at best. Yet through most of that second half, he was, you know? Um, yeah. So that's where I start. You can say it's a team thing, and I don't disagree. Other guys have to step up as well. Maybe they get, maybe they should rethink Joey as the inbound guy. I don't know. The, the problem is I don't know who else is a candidate for it because you want both of Tyson and AJ available to receive a pass, right? Because they're your right. guards. They're the guys you want with the ball in their hands against pressure. So it's kind of a tough spot. Michigan State traditionally has used a guy like Joey with some size um, to be the inbound guy, but maybe they, maybe they look at that. I don't know, but to me, it's, it really starts with AJ Hogarth because at his best, this is a guy who can be as good as any point guard in the big 10 and the big 10 isn't loaded with great point guards right now, but he can be as good as anybody in the league in that area, in my opinion, as an all around player, but we have only intermittently at best seen that so far this season. Yeah. So something's got to change there. That's, that's where it starts. Um, and you know, and unlike the Oregon game where, you know, I, I remember mentioning, Hey, the one thing you could take solace for is, 
yeah, Michigan State let them hang around, but they did hit six big free throws late to put that one away. Okay, so there was something that they did proactively to get that win, even though it wasn't great late, late, great late game play. This one, there was nothing. The last bucket they got was with, I think it was a minute 10 to go. Tyson Walker on a great take and finish puts him up nine with a minute 10 to play. That should be it under any yeah. circumstances, any situation. I don't care if you're playing uh, the Golden State Warriors ball game. <laughs> yeah. And it wasn't ball game because of the mistakes that were made and that we've continued to see, uh, you know, they've still unfortunately got some more basketball games to get through. Um, and I'm trying to think of how the schedule goes. You've definitely got Notre Dame, Penn state, Northwestern. And I think maybe Brown, is it Brown, Oakland, and, Brown Oakland and Buffalo before the break and, and, and Buffalo Brown and Buffalo. Oh, oh. Do you mean before the Big Ten starts or before? No, no, a little before break? The, they have a nine day break around the holiday. I'm I'm talking about what's between them and that. There's Brown on the tenth, and then Oakland on the twenty first. Okay, so it's so it's Brown. It's uh, it's so it's it's four more games, right? Notre Dame, the two Big Correct. Ten games, Brown. Yep. Okay, so four more games they got to get through, but I really feel like for this, for this specific area, and I'm going to be very interested. We're recording this essentially right after the game. So we don't know yet what Tom Izzo's had to say, but I have to believe That's why Rod's so hot. I have to believe he's <laughs> going to speak to this. They've got to get it fixed. And, you know, I, I hate to say this, but Robbie Hummel made a point that is beyond debate, which is this has been an Achilles heel, not just this year. This has been a problem. And I don't know. It's look, fans oftentimes expect that teams should be able to work on and excel in every phase of the game. And the fact is, like most other things in life, that's not true. There are trade offs. You only have a certain amount of time available to you, and you have to choose what you're going to spend it on. And Michigan State, I would think is probably not spending a great deal of time on late game situations, but somehow this has to get addressed. The, the, the worst part of it is if you look at drawing up a team that should be able to handle this, they're it. Now I realize yeah. they're not, they're not at full strength, but in a, you know, in a full strength situation, you've almost certainly got Jaden Akins out there with, it's probably Jaden Akins, Walker, Hogard, Hall, and Hauser, right? That's a lineup where you should, in theory, be comfortable with any of those five guys handling the ball, passing the ball, shooting free throws, right? Yep. Any of them. And, and so this should not be a problem. Even with the current assortment, the current roster they've got, I'll take Pierre Brooks. Pierre Brooks has got a decent handle. He's a good shooter. You know, Mati Sissoko's not a handler, but certainly if they foul him, you know, he's he's shooting free throws well enough that you're probably okay with that. Um, and yet we're seeing this. A team with this kind of strength in its backcourt should not go through this stuff, you know? And it's it's just a shame because it ruined what was going to be a very, very enjoyable podcast <laughs> for us to do. Because up <laughs> until that last, I was really impressed with the way Michigan state played in the second half of this one, really impressed. I mean, I, I'll say this, we, we kind of, we didn't have a lot to say about Portland because I just hadn't had a chance to see them. I had delved into the stats a little bit. Um, but I think they did kind of live up in a way it, to most of what I expected. Um, they shoot the ball very, very well. And you saw that this is a good shooting team more than that. I was impressed by the cleverness of what they run. They mm -hmm. do a great job screening, staying moving and getting themselves open for shots. I mean, that's a, that is a tough team to cover. And I think, you know, their, their Achilles heels, their problems are rebounding and, uh, and the defensive end, but in the conference they play in the WCC, it's often kind of defense optional. You know, yeah. I mean, it's a longstanding criticism of Gonzaga is that they're not a, a much of a defensive program. 
I, I think St. Mary's often fits that mold. You know, the better teams in the WCC are not generally towers of strength defensively. So to me, I would think Portland has, they were picked fifth, which is middle of the pack, but I, based on what I saw and, and the other results they had from this weekend, I've, you know, I've got to think that they've got a chance to compete in that league. What that eventually means, who knows, but I was very impressed with them offensively. And yet yeah. Michigan state, I thought really, really turned it up defensively in that second half. It was impressive to watch. And you know, and offensively, they were pretty good most of the game. I mean, even with that late flurry of the three turnovers, MSU ended up with eight. So in the first 39 minutes of the game, essentially, <laughs> five turnovers. Yeah. That's yeah. fantastic. You know, that's exactly what you want. And you would say any game, Michigan State commits eight turnovers, wins the rebounding battle, shoots better than 50% from the floor and plus 40% from three. And you win by one? How is that even possible? But it was because we saw it. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, right. Yeah. Well, let me go through some splits because, you know, I think in the one thing about these splits, the halftime splits is it's not going to show the last minute because that I think is a different, like he said, it's almost like a third game. Uh, first half, Portland, the score is 42-34. They were dominating in the sense that they had, they were 9 of 19 from three. They were also, when they weren't hitting uh, the threes, they were, off those ball screens, they were just killing us going in and getting some easy uh, plays of the hoop. Uh, they were uh, out rebounding Michigan State eighteen to seventeen. They had eleven assists on those uh, on their sixteen field goals. They had um, only one turnover. Michigan State had seventeen rebounds, so they were out rebounded. Uh, nine assists and fourteen buckets. Uh, three turnovers for Michigan State, which you know pretty good. And Michigan State was four or six from three. Just the volume was you know way less than what Portland was. The second half. I, again, outside of those last that last minute, Michigan State was doing great. They shot fifty seven percent from the half uh, to end the game at fifty two and a half percent. Shot four of eight from three. Uh, Eighteen rebounds to eight for Portland. They had uh, t- eight assists to six for Portland. I, I mean, every facet of the game outside the last little bit, they were they were clearly the better team, and a lot of that was due to AJ Hogar, like you mentioned. He was much better in the second half until the very, just the very end of the meltdown. Uh, and, I, you know, I don't know. I mean, I guess, well, let's talk about the, the shooting because I think, you know, we expected Michigan State to be as good shooting as they were last year. Maybe not exactly, but I was super impressed. I know you've gone on about a couple times about how you expected a lot from Pierre Brooks, but he was really fantastic from outside tonight. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the thing about him is, and he, and he showed this really in the Oregon game where, what did he, he ended up three for 11 from three. It really should have been five for 13, but you know, right, yeah. um, if he'd shrink half a shoe size, it would have been, but, but still, <laughs> um, the important part of that is he doesn't show any fear. He was willing to keep shooting. And I know he's a capable enough shooter that if he does that, it's kind of like the Tyson Walker effect from last year. If he takes shots, he's going to hit them. You know, and that sounds simple, but it's not so simple for everybody like, like Tyson Walker last year. Um, but Pierre Brooks is confident and that confidence is going to be a, a very important factor, I think, for Michigan State, because not only is he confident, he believes in himself, but he's got a quick release. So he's hard to guard out there and. And he's got a knack for hunting shots too, getting himself in spots. But I, yeah, very impressive offensive game from him. Um, you know, and, and as a team, the shooting, there's not much to complain about. You shoot 53% overall, 57% at the line, or 57% from three, rather, eight for 14. The only complaint there maybe is that they didn't generate quite enough threes. 14's, yeah. 14's a little light, but remember we talked about in the pregame for doing a quick analysis. I'm actually pretty happy with aspects of how this one worked. It was one of the things I talked about was this Portland team is really poor defending in the paint. And so Michigan state was 23 for 45 inside the arc. So they did attack. 
inside the arc where I figured they were going to need to, and they produced in there. They got a lot done. Um, give Portland credit, I guess, for taking a lot of that away. I mean, they definitely were extending out on the out on the arc and limiting Michigan State's looks, uh, which again, going back to Pierre, made it so important that Michigan State had a guy who really doesn't feel like he even needs more than a sliver of space to get a shot up because they didn't have a lot more than that. Um, You know, the, the shots that Hauser and Walker hit were the other two guys that hit threes in this game were, were much more of the wide open variety for Pierre. It was was at least a couple of his were under more duress and that was kind of going to be what it would take um, in this game. So, yeah, you're, you're very happy with the shooting. Um, You know, the positive there again, the turnovers, this is the other thing, too. Eight turnovers as a team. Hogarth had five. Hauser had three. Everybody else, zero. Zero. Yeah. So, you know, is that good? It's It, it represents progress in a sense. But, yeah, the timeliness. <laughs> when those turnovers happen uh, and the nature and of what them, kind they are, right? I yeah, mean, the nature just, of them, right, exactly. You just can't have it. So, I, I keep beating the drum on that but it's the lasting impression i have of this game now all that said i do i do want to give michigan state one little bit of credit for what they did in in the uh end game situation the way they defended that last possession was pretty good yeah um kid guy was a robertson i think that Mm -hmm. got to the rim and i'm trying to remember if it was just Mahdi or if it was a couple guys who challenged him and made that into a very, very tough finish. And of course he couldn't finish it rebound kicked out and kid was left making a desperation. heave that didn't come close to hitting the rim, but, uh, but they did do a decent job defending that last possession. Uh, You know, it makes a difference. I guess if you can get set as opposed to scrambling after you've just thrown the ball to the other team, (laughs) you know, funny how that works. (laughs) No question. Well, and, and I think, you know, another thing to look at uh, is when you look at rebounding, I don't think there's any questions, you know, I'll, this is the last time I'm going to say this. I don't think there's any questions a much better rebounding team that we've had. And to your point, uh, you've, you've mentioned a number of times when you look at team rebounds and as a, as a measure of effort and sort of, it you know, going be, after yeah. the ball. Yeah. And I think, you know, you look at team rebounds, they had three and uh, Michigan State had eight. And there was no question there were a lot of times when, like I know one of those was at Hogard. I don't know if it was the second half where he, where it looked like they were going to get an offensive rebound. He kind of Took came away. behind yep. and sort of stripped it, stripped a little bit, and it ended up Absolutely. off the Portland player's leg. And, and then of course Whitens too, who was I thought yeah. Let's great. talk about I mean, him. He was Let, let's, yeah seventeen minutes and yeah. Well, let's talk about rebounding first, and then we'll talk about Whitens. It's it's not all a function of effort, but sometimes it is on the glass and. I do not fault Michigan state's effort. And again, this is, I don't want to keep making excuses, but this is with your two best perimeter rebounders, at least not playing. Uh, and in a game where there are a lot of threes going up that that's, you're going to get challenged there, right? A lot of long rebounds and Michigan right. state held it down. I don't know what, what did Portland end up with in terms of offensive rebounds? So their offensive rebounding percentage was 23%. Yeah. And Michigan State's and, was 36%. And look, they're, they're not a good rebounding team, so it should be like that. But we know that that doesn't always play out, you know? And, <laughs> not last year. Yeah. yeah. And and so when you're limiting the opponent to one and done, that's that's a big deal. And and I do think you're right. That, that team rebounding stat in this game definitely – was reflective, not, not so much of, you know, poor, sometimes it could be that, oh, the other team just can't squeeze it. They keep losing mm-hmm. what should be secure rebounds, right? Sometimes, but oftentimes it's the result of whichever team is competing a little harder and being a little tougher on contested rebounds. And that was Michigan State. I think Michigan State earned those tonight. So that was a positive. No question. So let's talk about Jason Whitens, the guy who's forgotten by everybody. Uh, you know, he's he's a he's not a scholarship player, and so there's always mentioned that there are only, you know, nine or ten scholarship players in the team, and one was going to be redshirted. And and you know, Michigan State should retroactively go into the portal to get some guys. Um, you know, Whitens, I think showed showed that they've got they've got a 
really good player who, you know, he's not going to light it up. Although he did have that one jumper that he looked like he was trying to pass. Like, well, I guess I'll, t- I'll take this 10 footer or something. But he was, he his energy and his de- defense and his rebounding, just getting after the ball is, I don't know, it's impressive. He should be in the rotation the rest of the way. And, and, and what that means from game to game, I think can and will vary. But he should be in the rotation the rest of the way. I just, I, I've seen enough. You've seen hints of it in the first two games of this tournament where at the very least you saw him flying around. You saw the effort, right? Um, I, I think tonight it was a more complete thing. The, the main, main reason he should play is his defense. He was getting used uh, in both halves. I think one, because Michigan State you know, third game in four days, they probably yeah, some right. guys were a little gassed. And so Izzo felt like he needed to extend that bench just to keep guys fresh. Um, but I also think what Jason Whiten has already proven, at least to my satisfaction, I would assume to Tom Izzo's, is that he can use him as one of Izzo's favorite tools. Whiten's gives him access to one of his favorite tools. And that is a guy you can (laughs) depend on to play the right way, do the things that Michigan state values in order to help teach and hold other guys accountable. So Pierre Brooks, you fall asleep at the switch too often on defense. Here comes Jason Whitens. You know, it's, it's that kind of thing. And he's done enough in my mind, at least to demonstrate that he should be given that role. He should be given that opportunity. You mentioned you know two offensive rebounds. Um, the the one bucket was a fairly easy one. It was a lay in. He just kind of found himself open yeah. around the rim. But the second one, remember that was a bad inbound pass decision that he showed some athletic ability by going up and getting it, and then because of the contest, he found himself in a position where he had an open path to the middle of the lane, and he made the right decision. He didn't force anything. So many guys in his situation, not playing much up to this point, you know, hasn't really played much in two years because remember he was hurt all of last season. So many guys would freeze. Maybe they, maybe they would back the ball out or they try to force a pass to someone. Instead, he looked pretty under control. I don't know that he wanted to take that shot, but I think he understood that he should and he hit it. Yeah. Um, but you know, the scoring aside, the biggest things are, are the defense and the energy. And when you can, when you can do those things, man, Tom Izzo is going to play you This history tells us this over and over again. And he's done it in the past by using walk-ons, you know, uh, Mike Keebler from Okemos years ago was that Tim Bogracos, um, you know, and those are, but Bogracos, uh, is, is really very much a comparable guy to Whitens because Borgracos could have been a scholarship player at a Mac or horizon level, you know, Austin Thornton, Austin Thornton had high major offers. I believe he had an offer from Stanford that he passed on to go to Michigan state. And, you know, and he eventually became a scholarship player, but he's another example. I, I don't see any reason why we should think of Jason Whitens in any lesser way fundamentally than those guys. And all those guys I just named, were, were players that contributed to very good Colby Wallen at a different position, but still um, all those guys contributed to very, very good Michigan state basketball teams. So, you know, if, if you take that as a, as being true that, Hey, Jason Whitens deserves to be in the rotation. Once you get hall and, um, and Aikens back, what are we talking about? 11 guys, right? Yep. Well, that looks like a pretty standard Tom Izzo team. Now, I don't know that, <laughs> yeah. you know, I think situations are going to be important. You know, it might be that there's a game that Whitens doesn't play just because, you know, they're getting good defensive effort from everybody and it just doesn't lend itself to that. But man, he's already, he, and he, you know, the other thing too, and this, why this would surprise anybody, I, I don't know, because we're talking about a guy that was a starter for two years at the Mac level. This is not a guy they just found at the IM, you know? <laughs> um, yeah. He looks comfortable out there. 
He doesn't look rattled. He doesn't look sped up. And I'm talking about both ends, you know, but even offensively, he looks comfortable to me. They're not asking him to go out and hit shots and make a ton of plays, but he looks all right. And, and if he's doing that, then he's not going to hurt you much at all, if at all, offensively. And you've got him out there primarily for the effort stuff that he gives you. So I'm very, very happy with him. But, you know, I think if there's, if there's a, a major silver lining to come out of this weekend, other than the fact that Michigan State did manage to win two games, um, mm-hmm. I think it's that they're young guys collectively, and I'll include Whitens as far from young, but I'll, I'll include him in that category. The three freshmen and Whitens all to me demonstrated, hey, relax. They're going to be fine. These are guys that can help you win basketball games. They're capable of hanging in there because they all had moments in this tournament. You know, today, this was not a great game for, for Jackson Kohler. Missed some very makeable shots. I, I don't know what was going on there, but, um, you know, but Carson Cooper stepped up, made a couple plays offensively. You know, they were dunks, but nevertheless, got himself open. I thought the play he made on the inbound with Joey was that where he was the inbounder was actually a very sad yeah. play. Great play. Um, just hang around, find space. And, you know, <laughs> lots of, lots of good big men have made careers out of that. Um, <laughs> and he hunted in there defensively. So Carson Cooper showed up. Trey Holloman didn't play much at all in the first half. And then they did turn to him down the stretch, made a big jumper and did his usual thing on the defensive end. You know, I think they've got a particularly if, I'm going to back up half a step. If AJ Hogard continues to play with, let's take the last minute and change aside. If he continues to have halves like he had the first half, the most shocking thing in this game to me was that Tom Izzo kept him playing and didn't use Trey Holloman more to hold him accountable. And I say that I'm shocked because you know, for all the people who over the years I've heard squawk about Izzo and say, oh, you got to let guys play through mistakes, which has never been Izzo's modus operandi ever. Yeah. Um, that's essentially what he did with AJ. And it was surprising to me because I thought there, there were plenty of opportunities where I, if it were me, I would have said, AJ, grab a seat. And I would have rolled with Trey Holloman because I know at least Trey Holloman's going to give me maximum effort. I know he's going to check people and I know he's going to make good decisions with the ball because I haven't seen him do anything but that this entire year when he's played. You know, he doesn't give you the same things as a, as a scorer right now, but so what? You know, at some point, you've got to get, you got to reach AJ. And I'm thinking that's a card that they haven't yet fully played. When Jade Nakins is back, which hopefully will be as soon as Wednesday, um, for those who were watching, note that he was not wearing a boot today. Um, he didn't play, obviously. He didn't dress, but he wasn't wearing a boot, which to me is a sign that you're probably going to see him on Wednesday. Um, I would assume so. Uh, but yeah. when Jay Nakins is back, maybe it gets a lot easier to hold AJ accountable. But to me, uh, Trey Holloman's done enough, too. I would play him, mm-hmm. give him, give him an extra turn, give him an extra four minutes and let's let AJ figure it out or not. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I think, you know, when it comes to Izzo and dealing with players, you know, I don't know, you say coaches are like psychologists or whatever, you know, they're your parents kind of, you know, like your dad trying to figure out, they know how to motivate you or trying to figure things out. And, you know, I'm, there's a learning process when you have a player how do you get this person to maximally perform? I mean, think I know that's absolutely what he wants to do for everybody. And um, I think probably it's just, it's a learning curve for him too, to try and figure out what is it that he can do that's going to make AJ listen, right? I think that maybe it's not putting him in the bench for a little bit. Maybe he's trying to just yell at him when he's on the court. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm not sure. I, I, I wonder if that's what he's just trying something different. I mean, it was a different situation because you're right. We're depleted. We don't have as many players. And so I don't know. Maybe, maybe, but um I, I just look at who Tom Izzo has been throughout his entire coaching history. Right. And, right. and the, the let them play through mistakes thing has not ever, ever, ever 
<laughs> been in his vocabulary. It just is not the way he's ever approached it. And by the way, I think the track record tells you that that's probably a pretty good way to go. I'm, I'm not, I don't know many programs, honestly, who, who don't approach it that way that are successful. You know, the one, the ones that, that do, I think, you know, uh, look at a team like Memphis last year, for example, you know, they, they end up being teams that are sloppy, unreliable. Um, you can't count on them. Uh, there's no predictability. Mm -hmm. There's not much improvement, you know, all of that. And, and so I don't think Izzo's an outlier in that regard. I just, I think he might be uh, slightly less flexible than some other guys, but I think most all of the good ones do that. So it would be weird to me if he suddenly decided, especially his point guard. I mean, that's the thing. We're not yeah. just talking about any player. We're talking about the guy who's supposed to be the leader of your whole offense, right? That, that's what he's supposed to be. And the, the, the lack of focus, I won't say effort. I'll say lack of focus and the mistakes just, they're not excusable from anybody, but especially your point guard. I think we'll talk, let me just talk about a couple more stats that I think were that sort of illuminating for what happened. So points to the paint, Michigan State won 42 to 20. Not surprising. We go. mentioned that they really got in. The, we got we talked that, about that was, it. This team, yep. Portland is, is just not a team that defends the two well, and they didn't. Michigan State took advantage. And Michigan State had eight turnovers. Portland had 15 points off those turnovers. So this is very much like the Oregon game. Oh. They don't have any turnovers, but they scored a lot of points. Yep. Michigan State had well, uh, have Portland nine, five turnovers. Nine Michigan in the State's... last minute, right? Well, Three right, threes. yeah. So it wasn't and, so bad fast, before that. Right, and fast break, break points, the last thing. Portland had 14, Michigan State had four. Uh, you know, that's the uh, whatever, yeah, you, I don't whatever you want to say about the fast break points. But I would say that... I don't think Michigan State's break was not running well. I just don't think they had many opportunities because I think Portland was back all the time, which is, may contribute to the fact they were offensive boards were like you know twenty percent or something. Yeah, they, Portland, Portland was very definitely conscious of floor balance, and you know again, I'll give these teams credit. We have yet to run into a game this season that we normally will have seen by this time, where somebody just isn't prepared for what Michigan state does. And especially is the often the case in these holiday tournaments where somebody's just not prepared for it. And Michigan state is able to just blitz them. We haven't seen that. So ha Portland's a well-coached team. I mean, I I'm impressed with Shantae oh, yeah. leggings. I really was. Um, they do a lot of nice things offensively. They, they're together. They look like a connected team. Um, I, I don't know how much better they can get defensively because I think there's some athletic limitations there that hurt them. But um, that's, you know, that said, they did a great job of at least preventing transition. And that will matter in their conference if they can continue to do that because team, we know Gonzaga likes to push the ball. Um, you know, there's some other teams in that league that will go up tempo if you let them. And if they could continue to at least do that much, they'll, they'll likely give themselves a chance. Yeah. And our conversation would be entirely different had we played 58 minutes. <laughs> right. 38 I mean, minutes. It was, yeah, exactly. Or sorry, 38 minutes. Yeah, 38 minutes. Right. Yeah. Those last two, I mean, it was a 12-point game. It was not – and Michigan State had definitely dominated the second half. Yeah. They, out, they out rebounded them, everything. They out everything them. And then sort of the wheels fell off. But it was a, it was a dominant performance in the second half – which is what you expect and anticipate from a power five school that, you know, playing WCC. Even so, even considering the eight Oh run in the last minute and 10 Michigan state still outscored them by nine in the second half. So right. that even the collapse didn't change that the Michigan state really won and controlled the second half for the most part. Um, you know, and that's that, that matters, that counts, uh, you know, and the, and the thing was they got, right out of the shoot, you know, it was that there was obviously that segment where they scored seven points, five of them from Mahdi. And I, I think Tyson got the other two. I don't remember for sure, but five from Mahdi on uh, a lob dunk, uh, a foul. And the foul was then labeled a flagrant and, and he stepped up and hit all three free throws, which was impressive, you know? Um, so uh, 
there was a lot to like if we're if we're able to take a half step back about the things Michigan State did in the second half, just not the way I think you said it was like three games. So it was the first half, which offensively was okay, defensively was not good at all. The second half, where offensively and defensively they were really good, um, and then there was the last minute and ten seconds. So if you had to guess right now, what would you guess at Mati Sissoko's free throw percentages for the season? 70, 75? Right. 70%, 69%. So okay. he's 10, 20 of 29 this season. So All right. yeah, really he, impressive. I mean, for, I, this is a guy who shot 42% last year. Not granted, not probably a ton unlike, of attempts. But, right. But, 5 of 11 or something. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, and he looks, look, I don't think it's a fluke. Now, I'm not saying he's going to stay at 70. But if you told me before the season, hey, maybe Body Sissoko ends up at 65%, 63% even, I would take that. Because a guy who's a big man who's plus 60%, you can probably afford to keep on the court in late game situations, which matters. It matters a lot because of what he gives you defensively and what he gives you as a rebounder. Now, he didn't have great rebounding stats in this game, but you know, Madi is a guy who just by his presence, I think sometimes will make it easier for other guys to get rebounds because he will occupy opponent yeah. players and take up space. Um, so I thought he played well again in the second half. He played far better. Uh, that's probably the best half of basketball he's played since Kentucky. I mean, statistically, it's easy to say that, but um, yeah, it was it was good stuff from him. Yeah, and I'm just going to down this free throw thing. It is interesting because A.J. Hogard, 63% shooter last year. He's 83% this year. Yeah, and, that, that's, and that's including, stunning. is that including tonight? Yeah, that's including tonight, two of four. Yeah. Okay, yeah, because I was going to say he didn't do himself any favors tonight. Yeah, and it, well, we've talked about it before, and he did do the job. You know, he hit, he hit two big ones down the stretch against Oregon. Um, so he has hit pressure free throws. Uh, in the recent, in the very recent past. Um, yeah, that's a big deal. And that's, again, it's, it's just, I am so frustrated by this guy because <laughs> he's your point guard. <laughs> he's done exactly what you would want him to do. He stepped up as a free throw shooter. So if teams want to try and foul him in late game situations, you should have a level of confidence that he can step up and hit them because he's been doing it. And as we've talked about here previously, it's not a fluke. His shot looks fluid, you know? Yeah. Um, it looks real. Yeah. yeah, for sure. So God, he's got all the, he's got size and strength. Teams shouldn't be able to bully him with pressure as easily. And he should be able to see over traps more easily than say Tyson Walker, who he's got four inches on, you know, there's just no reason why I, I hate to keep coming back to it, but it just, it's so frustrating and if it's frustrating for me talking about it how must tom Izzo feel <laughs> because it's well, I, and, I sent out yeah. a tweet at the end of the game that i feel like aj hogard's very rapidly getting into the can't win with him can't win without him category and what i mean by that is he does so much and is so for you and is so important to your team that you have to have him out there but yet he's also making mistakes that just kill you so what a conundrum. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I really don't, I don't have any bright ideas about how to handle it. He's just got to get better. His focus has to get better. Right. I think it's between his ears right now, right? He's got to figure out who he is and, and how important he is to the team. And to be that, you know, like you said, you've made a point many times before, a good teammate and um, know when to get his own and when to, and when to, when not to, right. I think, and, and when not to be casual, he just to, be, to keep me to that focus. I just think about the great point guards. There have been so many of them at Michigan state, you know, yeah. you start with Cleves and, and then, you know, Drew Neitzel, Kalen Lucas, Keith Appling. Um, if you want to call Denzel Valentine a point guard, uh, I'm not going to argue um, Cassius Winston. Certainly these, these were guys that, and I'm not saying they never made mistakes, but it wasn't like this. You know, I, I, I see, and I, just as we're talking, I watch a replay of that 
turnover that's going to get attributed to Joey. That was absolutely A.J. Hogarth's fault. He did nothing to step to meet the pass. He should have gotten tagged with all three of those. Is that the one the the one at sort of midcourt, half court where Joey had to take it up on no, the pass the half court no, line? No, this then... is well, that's another one too. I felt like he didn't come that, hard that enough. AJ to didn't meet make him. himself available. Yes, that, yeah. that there's a fourth one. I wasn't. I'm talking strictly about the the real end game, but you're right. That's another one. So, if you're looking at the film of this game, you could see a lot of things to like about what AJ Hogarth do or did rather. But um, that that stuff that's got to go. That's got to go yesterday because, yeah, they're getting by and they're finding ways to win. And I guess credit them for that. You know, ultimately getting the W is is the the ultimate verdict. Right. But, um, hey, this league, I, I, I watched Purdue absolutely <laughs> wax spank Duke today after they did the same thing to Gonzaga two days earlier. Um, to win the other bracket, the, the PK legacy bracket. Purdue looks very real to me. Surprisingly so. I thought they'd be okay. They look much, much better than okay right now. I've talked about Illinois. We know people expect Indiana to be good. You know, Iowa had a Pratt fall the other day against TCU, but TCU is a good team. I think Iowa is going to be tough to deal with. Maryland has been a pleasant surprise. I've seen Ohio State play, and though they're young in some spots, I like their team. The Big Ten right now has been the most impressive of the major conferences. I don't think there's much debate about that. Um, yeah. And so that's what you're going into starting, you know, week after next with two games against Penn State and Northwestern. Um, you're not going to be able – this stuff is going to bite them hard if they don't knock it off you know i mean it's an obvious statement but it's true they can't do this they have to find a way to get better at closing games out and you know it would be one thing if if we were sitting here and we've seen this before and all programs do where you look at it and you say boy all they had to do was hit their free throws and they just couldn't hit free throws but this is worse in my opinion it's much worse because at least that you could say, hey, sometimes the shots just don't drop, you know, and that doesn't tend to be a thing that repeats as much. This, this is problematic because now you've just got multiple games where guys at winning time, where it's simple plays that need to be made, can't make them. And yet we can go back and we can look at the Kentucky game twice and see them execute as beautifully as you will ever see a basketball team execute a late game situation. So you tell me which is the real team. Cause I don't know. I, well, you know, it, it's, it's sort of like, is it, you know, it's, it's almost easier sometimes when you're behind to execute than in, when you're ahead, you know, and maybe, maybe that's a little bit of it. It could be that with a lead, they are too relaxed that the focus level and, and AJ Hogard coming back to him again, seems to be a guy who needs to have that focus locked in whatever it takes. Cause if he lets it slip for a second, disaster happens, you know, and, and he's just, you said it, he's too casual. So that's got to change that the whole thing's got to change. They've got to, and I, I don't pretend to have the remotest clue at an answer. I just know it, it can't continue because if it does, they're going to start getting tagged with losses. And the shame of it is going to be, they're going to lose games that they have no business losing and where they actually earned a win by virtue of the way they played for, you know, 95% of it. Well, you know, the next matchup is in South Bend on uh, Wednesday at nine fifteen, and uh, on November 30th. So we'll see. We we'll hopefully get Jay Dakins back then and can, get a little bit back more to normal uh, rotation. And I, you know, the nice thing about it is we're, we're still in November. And so there's every, there's every reason to expect that Hogarth figures out whatever it is. He's got all, you know, he's got a good month to figure it out before the big 10 gets hot and heavy. But to your point, it's not, it's not three months from now. He's got to figure it out pretty soon. Otherwise it's going to look a little bit like last year where they're playing well. And you're kind of like these bad habits start, kind of accumulating and they just never fix them as you're rolling into the big 10 season, eventually caught up to them 
where they sort of just barely survived. Yeah, and, and that's true. I mean, that doesn't change that, you know, a, a typical Michigan State season is one where this evolves and improves and they get better. And that would most definitely improve or include improving this stuff we're talking about. But um, I, after a lot of downer talk from me, which listeners know is not my usual <laughs> place and don't don't take that to mean i'm down on this team's long-term prospects and, and you know here's a thing to really maybe pay attention to i'll reiterate what i said at the outset they're five and two right now and and honestly if i were picking that notre dame game you know i don't gamble i don't we don't tend to do predictions here michigan state ought to handle notre dame i i, I know it's in south bend Michigan, I've seen Notre Dame play. It's it's par for the course in recent years for, for a Mike Bray team. They're unathletic. Uh, they don't have a ton of size. They, fr- frankly, are awful defensively. Um, Michigan State should win that game even on the road. And if you do, you're 6-2 and two through this period. And, and with one of those losses being a one-pointer. And the other one, okay, first game without two of your top six guys, you know, the Alabama loss is what it is. Um, I think you could feel pretty damn good. I mean, even if they were to lose to Notre Dame, I think you feel okay, given the circumstances about where they are. But um, if they win it and they're six and two, hey, there's, there's not a lot to get upset about in the macro, right? Right. Um, the micro, yeah, we know there are things that have got to improve. But if you get that one and then you got two Big Ten games that, you know, it's never fun to go on the road. But if I've got to pick one arena to go in and play a road game, it's probably State College, Pennsylvania, because <laughs> the catacomb, because nobody cares. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, you know, Penn State. They do something. Well, we got plenty of time to get into it, but yeah. that's a game. Look, if you're Michigan State and you want to think that you're for real in the Big Ten, you go and you win that game on the road. You know, that's a winnable one. And then you play Northwestern at home. Again, those are games you should win. You get through that. You get through these next three games. And if somehow they win them all and they're sitting at seven and two, then hopefully, assuming the recovery time for Malik Hall remains intact in terms of what they talked about. You probably don't have them for Brown, but who cares? But you will have them for after Christmas. I mean, even you know Christmas would would be the four week mark. So what you hope is that they get him back before that. He's able to practice some, and then they've got him hopefully fully reacclimated by the time Big Ten play kicks back in. And by the way, yep. if you look at the schedule, even once it kicks back in. By Big Ten standards, it's a reasonably soft start. I know they've got Nebraska in there, I think is the first game after they come back in January. And then I want to say that maybe Minnesota, somebody else at the bottom end before they face Michigan in game five at Breslin. Actually, Michigan is this is uh, the second game. So oh, it is. Okay. So to your to your point of going through through the schedule, that the Oakland game is the twenty first. So it's possible we see Malik Hall play a few spot minutes there, maybe kind of getting back dusting off some of the rust. The 30th is Buffalo and you'd expect everyone to be at full strength yeah, at that, for that yeah. game. And then the third is Nebraska at home. And then also then at home against Michigan on the seventh. And then they head to Madison on the 10th. Yeah. I mean, kind of I an, I, we play Minnesota. an ideal yeah. realistic. It would seem to me. And again, I'm talking out of my ass to an extent because we don't have access to Malik calls medical records, but if you, but if you take, the assessment that we've been given by the program as gospel, more or less a conservative way of looking at it would be Malik Hall plays in the Brown game, because that would be five weeks out from the injury. The Buffalo game, the 30th, right? The Buffalo. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Buffalo game on the 30th. Um, that would be a very conservative way of looking at it. that's two extra weeks, you know? Um, and that would be fine because then you've, you've had them play a game before you go back into the big 10, you know, they, they'll be rust. I mean, it won't be perfect, but um, 
that's that's a very very realistic scenario it would seem to me and and that's the thing if you're able to get through this period and keep winning games wow you know i mean it's better still you know um so there's a lot to feel good about it's just you know it's like they they often say, you know, it's not always about the result. It's about the way you performed and the way they performed doesn't necessarily leave you feeling great. Um, but there were aspects of this game that were very impressive and that you can feel good about if you're a Michigan state fan. No question. And you've played arguably one of the hardest schedules in non-conference schedules in America. And if you were to come out of that six and two, I mean, you can't, for a team that wasn't even ranked to start this year, I mean, and I don't, and and I don't want to hear, you know, people tell, oh, Gonzaga isn't as good as people thought, and Kentucky's not as good as people thought, and Villanova isn't as good as people thought, and Oregon's not as good as people thought. Okay, I'm not, I'm not going to argue the fact that any of those teams have looked as good as perhaps people expected them to, but in some cases. There are very clear reasons for that. The latter two that I mentioned, absolutely, injuries are a big part of it. And the first two, I've got a feeling Gonzaga and Kentucky are probably going to be okay. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, when push comes to shove, I think they're probably going to have, we'll, we're going to look back in March and see if they had pretty good seasons. And that's all that ultimately counts if you're Michigan State. You just want the value of having played and in many cases beaten those opponents and I think they're going to have that. I, I think Oregon and Villanova are still uh, still going to be tournament teams, in my opinion, as a presu- uh, assuming that they do get most, if not all, of their players back and healthy uh, when they expect to. Um, you know, so it's it's don't let anybody talk you into not being enthused about the bottom line as to what Michigan State's done against this schedule. Because it's still impressive. And so much better than had you played Elkhorn State and Akron. Yeah. If it look, I'm gonna point it, it, that's such a good point. Right now, you know, Indiana is enthused and they think they're pretty good. They're going out and they're waxing people. You know, the only real game they played, they played Xavier on the road and they won by two. All right, that's a that's a good win. A road win against anybody at that level is good. And Xavier's a pretty solid team. So They've played one game. Michigan State has played, <laughs> what is it? Five, am I missing four, right? No, one, two, three, four, five, five high majors. Because I'm counting Gonzaga as oh, a yeah. high major. They definitely are. Yeah. Five, all of whom at the start of the season were expected to be tournament teams. And I would still bet that they all make it right now. I would still bet they all make it. We'll see if I'm right about that. Um, and you're three and two, you're three and two against that level of competition. That's, that's strong stuff. You know, when people talk about the big 10 surprising and being very impressive in the non-conference so far, Michigan state's a huge part of that, but make no mistake. <laughs> right, yeah. Absolutely. So, um, uh, yeah, there's a lot to be enthusiastic about. You just, you got to take a little broader view and, and also make some assumptions about uh, the ways in which Michigan state can and will get better. Yeah, And I like, and, and from a sort of like a macro view of Michigan state, I like the fact the shooting seems to be as good as it was last year. The rebounding has improved. I mean, there's, there's every reason to think that this is going to be a much better team than last year. So, you know, I, I think you can expect more things from this team and I think they've shown it so far, even though they've been depleted this last two games or three games. And, and, and one more point along those lines, which we're, we're never going to know until until we can look back and see what the what the end result was. Right. But um, and, and I know I alluded to this earlier, something very important could have come out of this period this weekend and and maybe even the next game or two. Um, and that is that Michigan state is finding guys who can allow them to lengthen their bench. You know, um, Pierre Brooks, it's, it's not all been, you know, uh, seashells and balloons as, uh, Al McGuire used to say, (laughs) 
Um, there have been defensive issues. There's been some focus and effort issues, but at the same time, has he proven to be a guy that, you know, can go out there and score for you? Absolutely. He has, has he shown that he's capable at least of making defensive plays at times? Yeah, he's done that too. So he's given you reason for optimism. I think that, Hey, he can really be a guy you count on even when he's no longer starting even when he's back in a reserve role, you know, we talked about all those, those three freshmen, they've all had moments just in the last four days, all three of them have had moments where you could look at it and say, I could see this guy coming. He's going to be part of something and he's going to be better in February than he is now. And then you add whitens to that mix. That that's a, that's a positive thing. And they wouldn't have had the same opportunity to learn as much about those guys and get them the opportunities that they've had if you had your full complement of players. So, you know, looking at silver linings, that that may end up being one, is that they found that their bench can be a little bit more than people thought. Right, and the, not only did you learn all those things, but you also went 2-1. I mean, that's, that's yeah. pretty great. You won two games while, you know, while you're at it. By the way, but the other thing that should be mentioned here, I, I, we haven't even touched on it. Um, both at least nominally road games. I mean, <laughs> yeah, the, true. The Oregon, yeah, Oregon. I don't know what did, did we talk about? We Oregon? did the fact did that we they were, well, this? I think that there were uh, probably more Michigan state fans and Oregon fans. And I would just say in general, I'm shocked at how few fans there were at these holiday tournaments. I mean, I guess it's Portland and it's the winter. It's not really a nice time to be there, but it's, it's, it's surprising, really sad. right? It's sad. Um, and I mean, I'm, I've got, as we're talking, I've got Gonzaga and Xavier going on and, um, you know, Gonzaga, especially, you know, not, not that far away. Right. right. Spokane. That's, that's a, that's a respectable drive. It's, it's empty. I mean, it's better than the two games Oregon was in that. I, that's the thing. What I was going to say is, um, I watched a little bit of Oregon and Villanova today, and it was just as empty, if not more. So it was more empty than the Oregon Michigan state game, uh, primarily because I would think Villanova didn't bring as many people as MSU right. did. Um, but that is, that is hard to understand Now today was a little bit better because, you know, they're in the home city for Portland. And I felt like it was a decent turnout enough that, you know, that, that had a feel of a road game, right? A little bit. Yeah. Um, so give Michigan state credit for that, I guess. But, um, yeah, it, you know, it's one of these things. If you're not playing the, the two old reliables that I think just automatically without question have full gyms are, uh, are Maui and, um, uh, Atlantis. Yeah. Well, that Atlantis is tiny. And there can't be more than a thousand people could fit in that place. It's like a so is Maui. Maui's essentially a high yeah, school gym. Right. Um, yeah, that's part of it. But you know, the other thing is obviously those are vacation yeah. destinations that in November it's easier to get fans excited about going to. But yeah, it's it's real. And uh, you know, I'd have to go back and look to try to remind myself. But I mentioned the other day that it felt to me like this PK event was way down in terms of the hype around it, the attention, all of that, as opposed to the first one five years ago. And I'm wondering if attendance is also down because uh, it, it feels that way to me, but I don't have, I wouldn't trust my memory all that. But you look at the, look at the programs that are part of this oh, thing, know. Who's you who? know, Duke, North Carolina, Michigan state, Purdue. I mean, these are all not just, you know, historically great programs, but they're programs that have huge fan bases that travel, you know, and, and then you, and then you're adding in, you know, you've got all the Oregon, Portland, Portland state, Oregon state. So four in-state schools, theoretically, they should all be providing fans, but they really didn't in any meaningful way. Um, it's just hard to understand. I, well, and I don't know, maybe it's a reflection. Just people are, you know, if you're going to attend a sporting event in November and do any sort of traveling, you're, unless it's like super nice vacation spot, you're going to go some, you're going to go to football, you're yeah, going to go to football game. I you know, Oregon, Oregon State football is this weekend. And I don't know. Yeah, that that's, it has to be it, but it's just, it's really unfortunate because um, it just, the, the basketball, 
I'm not saying that the level of play has always been brilliant because over a four day event, yeah. it usually isn't <laughs> without many games, but, uh, but there's been a lot of exciting basketball today. We had what, North Carolina and Alabama go four overtimes. I think at least yeah. three, um, that's insane. You know, and, and there's so many really competitive games and, and games that were actually well played too. Uh, and, and to not have full throated, really impressive turnouts is, is disappointing, but eh, what can you do? You know, I always, not much. I always have to remember that uh, college basketball is a niche sport as much as I wish it weren't for 90% of the season. And then the 10% of the season, it has everyone's attention, you know? Right. Yeah. So it's almost like you shouldn't mess with that part of that, that 10%. Yeah. yeah you right. Be very careful with that. Right. Well, we'll see. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, I guess that brings it close to the feast week, which to your, I think you mentioned at the beginning of this, it was about a 10 or 11 day, uh, much like my wife's birthday gets stretched out for a week or a month sometimes. <laughs> yeah. And so it just kind of kept going and going. So Michigan State comes in through relatively unscathed, two and one despite the injuries, and they're going to be up next, like I mentioned earlier, uh, Notre Dame. We'll have a show in a couple of days with a preview for the Notre Dame, Notre Dame game. I'd encourage you to uh, subscribe in your podcast player and to not forget that on December 7th, that's the week after the Notre Dame game, uh, after the Penn State game, we'll be having on a retired assistant coach, Mike Garland, who will be coming to a post-game analysis with us, which we're very excited about, so make sure you don't miss that broadcast at all. So until next time, the Final Four is on the schedule. Go Green. Go Green.